Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dwi Kamala Devi. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics and human genetics at the University of Pittsburgh uh, School of Medicine. And today I'll give you an update about the uh, research that is currently ongoing in the lab, which is the development of therapeutic genome editing in LAMA2 CMD. Now, um, as many of you already know that LAMA2 is an important component of skeletal muscles and nerves. So um, I'm giving you a cartoon over here that if you zoom into um, the membranes of muscle or nerves, this thing over here, you see all these different components or proteins, including LAMA2. And together, they maintain the integrity of the membranes and gives it functions. Now, if uh, LAMA2 is missing, what happened is um, this complex will be very unstable and in a long term, it will lead to damage in the muscle and in the nerve. And that's pretty much what happened in LAMA2 CMD. Um, the work from many uh, scientists in the field has led us to understand that there is another protein called LAMA1 that can actually compensate for the lack of LAMA2, both in the muscle and in the nerves. Um, so this is a really long um, uh, studies and work from so many scientists in the field. So I'll just point, um, uh, point you to this uh, recent uh, review paper over here by Paraza Flores et al. Um, that was published earlier this year, if you want to uh, look into the history. Um, so for today, I'm just going to simplify everything and um, 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 phrase LAMA1 as what I like to call it, is the peculiar little sister of LAMA2. What do I mean by that? is that um, LAMA1 and LAMA2 are quite similar. They're about 8% identical. But the difference here is that LAMA1 is only expressed uh, during embryonic uh, stage, meaning that uh, when we are adults, uh, uh, our body somehow does not need LAMA1 anymore because LAMA2 can take over. Saying it in another way, if uh, our DNA is like a recipe book, uh, we have the recipe, our body has the recipe to make LAMA1, but it's too small or too uh, minuscule that we cannot really see it. So we need to actually have a tool to help our body to, to see LAMA1 and to make use of it. Um, so the goal of my research is exactly that so we try to develop a therapeutic strategy to upregulate our body's own LAMA1 using what's so called CRISPR activation technology. And um, the again, the, the big picture idea is to improve the condition of muscle and nerve in the LAMA2 CMD to something that looks closely resemble healthy muscle and nerve or healthy individuals. Right. So what is CRISPR activation technology? Before we go into nitty gritty, I'll just give you an analogy of, um, of what I think, uh, this, how I think this technology works. Um, if you are hungry, you and your uh, group of friends or your family are hungry, and you want to go to a restaurant that serves food, and food here can be um, equal to Lama One, how do you use technology to do that? We call Uber. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, many of you have used Uber in the past, and you know that to do that, we need to have pretty much four things, right? We need to have a car, we need to have the Uber driver that will guide you through um, using his GPS. And of course, you need to be there as well. So you need the passengers. Right, so in our body, this is how it works. Uh, what you see here is a location of LAMA1 DNA. There is a start a signal, and this region here is called proximal promoter. So we need to have the first component of the technology, which is called the guide RNAs. There are three of them targeting over here, the proximal promoter. And then we need to have the second and the third components of the technology, which is called Cas9. It's the purple blob over here. And transcriptional activators, which are the pink uh, blobs over here. And then you need to um, have them all packaged together. What happened when, when they are all together, um, there's a process called transcription that can be turned on in our body. And 
that makes lama one being expressed um, higher so that you know our body can see it um, again you need a vehicle so what is the car that deliver all of this to a body or a living being like a mouse for example the car is called av9 adeno associated virus uh, 9 so we package all of those and we introduce them to to the mouse right so we've gone through that and this is um, practically how, how it looks. So we have two cars, we have two AAV9s. Uh, one carries the GCAS9, one carries the VP64, and then the other AAVs uh, carry the dried RNAs. We then inject it into um, a baby or a neonatal uh, pups of a mouse model called GY2J that has very low LAMA2 and it has no LAMA1. So we inject them quite early and then we analyze this at the age of about seven weeks. So what, uh, what happened is over here, if you've never seen any um, LAMA2 CMD mouse model, this is your time over here, it has this characteristic of high and limb contracture and um, it's difficult for this mouse to, to move around. And why? Because um, there's no LAMA2 and there's no LAMA1 in the muscle. And that's how the muscle looks like, it's quite damaged. And in the nerve here, um, you're supposed to see expression of either lama 2 or lama 1, but it's not there because it's untreated. And the uh, nerve, uh, this uh, condition of nerve called myelination is, is damaged. In the mice that were treated with this um, uh, CRISPR activation technology, as you can see over there that it moves quite freely. So it's more active. Um, it can also stand up. At some point, it will stand up. You will just see it. And uh, the muscle over here, uh, it has lama one now expressed in the muscle. That's um, that's what we um, color in red. And this improved condition of the muscle. And here in the nerve, so see the mouse now stands up. <laughs> You'll just see it later. Um, the nerve here also has lama one being expressed in red. And you can see that the myelination is improved compared to the untreated uh, uh, nerve. All right, so that's what we've done um, so far. So we've, we've shown this as a proof of principle study that it is actually possible to do this. And we look at the efficacy in uh, nerve and in muscle. So what we wanted to do now moving forward is just like many other technology, we want to improve it. We want to make it cheaper. We want to make it safer. We, we want to make it better, basically. And how do we do that? Um, so if before we, we needed to have two cars, now we are aiming that um, can we actually have just one virus, so one car? Can we fit all these components of this CRISPR activation technology in just one virus? Because um, if we do that, then we will reduce the cost as well as um, toxicity, theoretically. Well, the cost for sure, but uh, the, the toxicity we'll have, to, we'll have to see. All right, and that's exactly what we wanted to do. So here, 2020 onwards, we'll try the single virus system. Um, instead of the DY2J mouse model that is considered milder uh, uh, mouse, we will uh, try it in the more severe mouse model called DYW, and we will look at efficacy in terms of survival, uh, muscle, nerve, as well as the breathing ability of this mice. And then from the other uh, point of view, which is not, um, uh, which is also important, is the safety. So we will look at um, how the mouse reacts to um, to all this CRISPR activation technology, as well as to the virus. So to be continued on that. Another question that we wanted to answer is also um, how do we take this beyond mouse model? So um, the way we do that in the lab is we take skin uh, biopsies from lama 2 CMD patients and then we can grow them in the incubator. And then uh, from here, we can either let the uh, cells uh, remain untreated or we can treat them with the CRISPR activation components. And as you can see here that in the untreated cells, uh, we don't have lama one but lama one is not expressed um, strong enough. And here in the treated cells, you start seeing expression of lama one 
So now we are looking at how we can actually uh, measure the therapeutic uh, potential or therapeutic benefit or therapeutic outcome in these uh, cells. And uh, I have limited time, so I'm not going to go into detail, but one of the way we wanted to do that is by measuring the energy production uh, from the mitochondria of the cells. And I'll be happy to chat about, uh, about that uh, um, during the Q&A. Right, so where do we stand right now? As um, I mentioned that we are uh, testing the, uh, a new way of doing this uh, by using a single virus activation system and looking at efficacy as well as safety. And at the same time, we also try to do that in uh, patient derived cells. These are uh, the members of my lab, um, all the you know, energetic uh, people who are uh, working together uh, to uh, get there faster because we want to develop, all of us want to develop therapeutics here and all the funding agencies. Thank you so much. Thank you for that video. Are there any questions after or due to this narrative we just heard from Ms. Kemla Dewey? I was probably speaking very fast. <laughs> you did present a wonderful overview, I do have to say. Um, I'm going to be a bit blunt, but Mr. Bunneman, you've been listening to this as well. What are the key aspects of this narrative that are important for the patients or family members to take away from it? So it's, a, um, it's an uh, extremely clever approach that is, again, I think, a root cause approach um, to the disease. So uh, even though it doesn't um, repair or replace uh, LAMA2, the gene that carries the mutation, it, um, it takes advantage of the body's backup mechanism, which is the LAMA1 gene, just like um, the lamin 111 protein therapy does as well. Um, but here we are um, basically telling the body to upregulate its own backup gene um, to kind of take the role of LAMA2. And so um, again, like the uh, lamin 111, it's a, it's a root cause approach to the disease by trying to replace the missing protein with the next best that we have. Um, but this uses a genetic approach that's coupled with the gene therapy approach, if you will, um, because um, the, you know, I think you call it the Uber car, <laughs> is, is yeah, um, the, a virus that, uh, that is used in gene therapy across neuromuscular um, diseases currently, but it gets a different cargo, it gets a different payload to achieve this upregulation. So it's technically complex, but um, uh, it, is, um, it is getting at the root of the disease. So really worthwhile following up to. Right, then thank you very much. I see no further questions. Uh, what I see one more from Oliver Talek. Is Laminin 111 working before birth? If so, why arthrogryposis can happen? I hope I did not butcher that word beyond recognition. I might need some help uh, understanding what arthrogryposis is. Uh, there is a reason arthrogryposis. So the, the, the question is a, a, a clever one, which is um, if, uh, if laminin 1, uh, lama 1, so laminin 111 is um, used before birth, but not after birth. So why do we then have clinical findings at birth in our patients, right? So that's a question, such as arthrogryposis, which means joint contractures at birth, is a really good question. And um, the answer to that is uh, LAMA2 is not completely expendable before birth. Uh, and LAMA1 before birth, even though it's higher regulated, is not fully making up for LAMA2 there either. Uh, so the approach of using LAMA1 is to even be better than LAMA1 expression before birth and really forcing it into the muscle uh, uh, by using either a promoter that drives it, so a, a genetic control element that drives it in the muscle much higher than even before birth, or to uh, supply the protein in high doses after birth. 
Um, so uh, a very perceptive question. The um, answer is uh, Lama 2 is not completely expendable before birth and not completely replaced by Lama 1 before birth, but Lama 1 is still conceptually able to make up for it if it's high enough in expression. Uh, so that's the approach here. Uh, another question I see in the chat is when looking at the CRISPR, is there a cutoff age for a subject to gain benefits from it? Please explain, expand if possible. Yes, yeah, so um, on the proof of principle study that we did before, uh, we tried as best as we can in our experimental design to, to actually uh, tackle that. So what I showed in the video was we studied the treatment at two days old, um, but then we also did some experiments when we started the treatment uh, when the mice were about three weeks old. And in the mouse world, that's where you started to see the contracture uh, from outside. And we were, uh, we were actually able to slow it down. But of course, another interesting question is uh, whether we can actually push it forward. And that's on the pipeline of all um, of our studies. Okay. And another question I see is, do you think it's possible that some of the techniques of the different researchers can be combined in the future or can complement each other? we should work together for sure <laughs> and should, we should complement um, 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 each other yes and that's a that's a real possibility the complementation of these approaches because um, if you think about it conceptually none of these approaches would kind of um, kick the other one out of the field um, so they, they wouldn't compete it at each other um, so the, for instance the more um, of the good stuff you get into the muscle, the better it is. So ideally, Lama 2, obviously, but then the next group one, Lama 1, and how you get it there can be different routes, but they're not competing each other off. So they're not kind of mutually neutralizing. So that could, that could all act in conjunction.